Hello and welcome to the Scarlet Faithful Podcast. I am your host and co-founder, Aaron Brightman, coming to you the day after Monday, following another disappointing loss for Rutgers men's basketball, uh, the regular season finale, senior night at the rack against Northwestern, and unfortunately, third consecutive double-digit loss at home. Rutgers started Big Ten play eight and four. They finish two and six, ten and ten overall. And they're the nine seed now going to the Big Ten tournament playing Michigan, the eight seed on Thursday at noon, 11 a.m. local time in Chicago, 12 p.m. Eastern time with a lot at stake for sure. They've essentially missed out on two games that really were clinching opportunities for the NCAA tournament. For sure, Minnesota on the road have that 10-point lead with a minute 15 to go. You beat Minnesota, you avoid, you know, a disaster loss just in terms of the metrics and perception, Big Ten standings, all that, and they couldn't do it. And then they come out and really, you know, Sunday night on its own is not, a terrible loss. I mean, Northwestern now finished second in the big 10. Chris Collins deserves to be coach of the year. Tremendous job by them. Uh, But due to the circumstances, you know, it is a very damaging loss. And I think also a very discouraging loss, just in the sense of, you know, Rutgers really wasn't very competitive in the game. Uh, They cut the lead down to six going into the half, but they gave up, you know, uh, they got back into a hole early in the second half. And, you know, it was, I think, the consensus that you never really felt they had a chance to get back into it. Um, and I think there's, you know, a lot of things to talk about. Uh, and I want to get into that. Uh, and that's why I'm having this podcast. And, you know, I just did want to say, I think if you're listening to this, you know me uh, and you followed my coverage before. But, you know, I, I am I'm a true Rutgers fan at heart. I have been following Rutgers men's basketball since the mid eighties when I was a kid. Um, you know, I was at the 1989 game at the rack as a, uh, 12 year old sitting in old section 118 under the basket to see them, uh, win the Atlanta 10 tournament. Um, you know, I, I was at the garden when they beat George, uh, Georgetown to go to the Big East semis. Um, you know, I've been at a lot of big games over the years and, and whether you've been at big games or not doesn't make you a better fan, but just to give a little history in terms of how long I followed this program, how many dark days I've seen with this program, as have you. Um, and, you know, this definitely, what we're going through right now is is up there. I mean, it's it's tough. It's tough. Um, you know, and it's honestly, it's uh, – everyone deserves to be able to react and complain – be angry, whatever you want to do, whatever emotions you're feeling, you you, you have every right to do that. I, where I've had issues with people and, you know, on social media and just in terms of how people are behaving, uh, it's when you forget the, the humanity of it all. And I know some people don't want to hear that. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, I think, you know, it's I, I'm, I'm more sad than anything just because we were so invested in these guys. I mean, you know, Kayla McConnell playing his last game at home and to go out like that. It's it's sad, you know, and it's it's not a, a personal reflection of him, you know. And as Steve Pichel said, he, he couldn't even practice on Saturday. He had six steals and he, he moved into second place all time, passing Miles Mack, you know, steals uh, second all time in steals in program history. You know, he's got a chance to, to win Big Ten uh, Defensive Player of the Year second year in a row. He's, you know, chance to win National Defensive Player of the Year. What he's meant to this program, you know, and I mentioned a couple times, and uh, I mean, before Caleb McConnell came to Rutgers, they, they, they had not won. You know, and he wasn't the only reason for that, but he is a big reason for that. So him alone, just, you know, under a microscope, you know, ending his career now and, and the way things are, uh, the way this season you know, is headed or it appears headed right now. Uh, it's sad. It's sad. You know, Paul Mulcahy, I mean, um, you know, he's obviously struggling. I think, you know, one thing that um, 
that I think doesn't get thought of enough. And maybe people think it's an excuse or whatnot. But I mean, listen, going back to the Moat Mag injury, you know, it was really, really uh, changed the trajectory of the season, changed the makeup of this team. I've been through, you know, what Mag brought to this team. I think, you know, his offensive impact is maybe underrated in terms of how people looked at it, but obviously defensively a huge impact. Um, but also I think it's 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 the 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 load that this team has shouldered since is also a big factor. I think, you know, to ignore the fact that um, you know, the starters have played huge minutes since. Um, you know, let's not forget how this season started with McConnell and Mulcahy missing t- significant time due to injuries, you know, and Caleb McConnell, <laughs> I mean, Caleb McConnell's probably never been fully healthy this whole career. And if he has, it's been a brief period. I think part of last year he was, but, um, you know, I mean, we don't know what's going on with Paul. We don't know if it's, you know, if it is an injury, if it's mental fatigue, if it's mental block, if it's, you know, what, whatever it may be. But he's obviously, I mean, he didn't forget how to play basketball. You know, he's been super effective and such a winning player for this program for a long time. So to see him going through this, you know, it's it's really hard. And I think everybody handles it differently. Um, And I think, you know, visceral reactions and emotional reactions and, you know, that's to be expected. But I think at the end of the day, too, you have to remember, you know, how much it means to these guys and, and what they've meant to the program and, you know, they, they deserve uh, the ultimate respect. And I wrote about this and said it over the weekend. But, um, you know, and that goes for how the season finishes. And, you know, yes, disappointment, upset. Um, but I think we hopefully can be as evolved as a fan base to have those emotions, voice those concerns, voice those issues, and also be able to step back a little bit and – respect them as people, respect them as, you know, their, their impact on this program. Uh, and to show, you know, show compassion, show class. And uh, because listen, also, <laughs> I mean, Paul Mulcahy can come back next year. You know, why wouldn't you want him to come back? And to, to say you're done with them. And I mean, it's just, you know, I, I, I do think that this team, has, it's not a coincidence that during his, struggles the team has struggled as well specifically on offense and um but i think there's some greater points that you could take away from this recent period i think depth is obviously an issue um you know i think the reliance and you know steve peichel obviously you know extremely loyal uh to his players to his guys that have done it before which is a an admirable quality um but i think also you know there, there's an argument to be made that at, at times now, I think it's 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 also hurting the team um, in terms of they seem worn out, you know, whether it's injury, whether it's just being banged up, whether it's mental fatigue, um, you know, whether it's just tired legs. I mean, you know, they're shooting free throws at a really low rate now, right now. They're shooting the basketball as a whole at a really low rate. They're making more mental mistakes on the court. I mean, the Minnesota ending was just uh, mental miscue after mental miscue from everybody, you know, coaching staff, Steve Peichel included. And it's a long season and it's a grind and they, they, they look worn out. Uh, they look worn out as a whole, as a team. And, uh, you know, Jerry Carino wrote about it today and I have written about Derek's, um, Derek Simpson several times and, you know, Jerry really pushed for it's time to, to essentially give the keys to Derek, you know, and, and hope that he can revive this offense and, you know, uh, Listen, he's not a perfect player either, and he, he's definitely not been an efficient shooter this year at, at all. But, you know, he has been their lone creator uh, off the bounce. And, you know, I do think last night, I mean, Northwestern had the perfect elixir for that high ball screen with, with you know, Simpson or whoever was was there, you know, and doubling doubling that play and not, not allowing for space. And I think that, you know, when we saw Rutgers offensively this year clicking, you know, they were sharing the basketball. They were moving without the basketball. And, you know, um, they're not doing that right now. They're, they're, they're doing that high ball screen and it's, it's, it's not ISO per se, but it's like the same thing. And yes, you can get different reads and different looks and it worked beautifully against Penn state, but you know, teams are going to adjust. And I thought Northwestern, which is a very good defensive team adjusted 
and really clamped up Rutgers in terms of what they could do. Um, I mean, they didn't play poorly offensively against Minnesota. It was the defense that was the problem. And then last night it was the opposite. So I think that's also a sign of a struggling team. You know, they just can't put it together. Um, starter minutes have been really heavy. I think fatigue um, has, has is, is taking its toll just from a mental and physical standpoint. And you're seeing it in, you know, reflection on how they're, how they're playing and, you know, rebounding even. I mean, they, they got out-rebounded by Northwestern by six. That, that was – I thought a sign that, you know, with a, with a kind of really a must win, um, you know, it's not that this team's not playing hard. They are, but they're missing that gear. They're missing that gear, you know, and you saw with, um, you know, Northwestern when they needed a lift, you know, they had guys that had energy that were able to give them a lift when they needed it most. And whether it was the center, you know, Matt Nicholson um, with Brooke, Brooks Bernheiser, uh, who had a huge game, you know, Boo Booey in the second half. I mean, they had guys step up and Rutgers just couldn't, they haven't had enough guys step up when the game was on the line and they needed somebody. And, you know, it's a collective issue. And, um, you know, when mag went down, I mean, the, the depth I think has been exposed now. And I think obviously recruiting is on the uptick, but I think we're seeing the depth issue too. I think, you know, Oscar Palm Chris has had moments, uh, I thought Antoine Wolfolk uh, has had moments. You know, he actually broke that when they had one fuel goal in 10 minutes last night in the first half after jumping out to the lead. Um, you know, I thought he uh, he's had his moments, but there's not enough of them. There's not enough substance on the bench. It was a problem last year, too. You know, and I think, you know, it's 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 gut wrenching, too, to see them lose like this at home. You know, three double digit losses, I think. Anyone that thought that the rack was a magical, had magic. The rack is not a magical place on its own. It can produce magical moments with the right performances, you know, with strong basketball being played by the home team. Uh, it can it can elicit these magical moments, but you can't step on the floor and all of a sudden you see fairy dust and, you know, you become a, a winning basketball team and, and, that's also, I think, you know, a credit to what they have done, you know, in recent years under Steve Peichel at home. It's it's phenomenal. I mean, they've won, uh, I don't have the stats in front of me, but it's over 80% of their home games, you know, in the Big Ten. I mean, they've been, you know, really, really good at home. And, you know, we haven't seen that the last three games. And it's it's not like it's, you know, it's, it's just that it's, it's a reflection of this team currently and where they're at. And I think, you know, I don't want to get too much into it because the offseason is not here. Uh, contrary to con uh, popular opinion or the wishes of some fans, the season is not over yet. Uh, you know, a lot of bracketologists still have Rutgers in the field of 68. Uh, obviously, they're in a very precarious position right now, uh, and they are in danger of completely missing the NCAA tournament. Um, but I will say that I think, you know, no matter what happens, even if they do make the NCAA tournament, I think that, you know, full evaluation of everything needs to, to, to happen after the season. Um, you know, and I, I, listen, there's – in a way, this is a good problem to have. You know, Rutgers is not falling apart as a program. I think it's very stable. Steve Peichel, you know, deservedly has a very um, stable long-term contract and – there is a lot of stability with this program. You know, this is a, um, I don't want to say hiccup, but it's, it's obviously what's happening right now is uh, changing the narrative per se, uh, or is a um, obstacle that has really slowed them down in the trajectory of the program. But it's not something that I think people, and, and, and there will be detractors that want to use this as a reason to prove that Peichel is not the right coach long-term, that the program is, you know, failing to meet rising expectations, that things are going to go south. It, those things have been said, will be said. I don't think that's the case. Um, but I think it is an opportunity to, to look back and say, hey, you know, because injuries do happen. And if next year, you know, a starter goes down, you know, th th this can't, they need to be in a stronger position than they have been to be able to handle it. And there's a lot to that.
uh, and again, a lot of that we could talk about in the off season. But I think initially or immediately, can they beat Michigan on Thursday? You know, that's their best chance to make the NCAA tournament. You lose on Thursday. I think I think there will be a consensus thought they have a chance to still make it on Selection Sunday. I think that it's less than 50% for sure. If they beat Michigan on Thursday, you get an opportunity at Purdue on Friday. I know people think it's over. It's also March. You don't know what a fresh start mindset, you know, and that's the thing. Like, I honestly, I really do. Th- like, there are plenty of pieces still on this team. And, and I know there's been a lot of expectation to be, you know, a lot of people saying it was a bridge year that, you know, because Rutgers was doing so well, expectations got, you know, almost unfairly raised. And that's why people are so disappointed right now. I very vocally was. I was pissed at the beginning in the preseason when Rutgers was picked eighth. You know, I thought it was insulting. I thought with Paul Mulcahy, Cliff Amori, Kayla McConnell back, Rutgers had as, you know, other than Indiana, had as much proven experience as a core back than any other Big Ten team. And I thought it was disrespectful that they were picked eighth. You know, I'm admitting that. I'm on the record anyway, but – You know, so I didn't look at it as a bridge year. I looked at it as this team can make the NCAA tournament for sure. They could finish in the top half of the Big Ten. You know, I thought they could challenge for a top four seed in the Big Ten tournament. So, you know, yes, I I thought they had enough back. Yes, they they had. There's plenty of questions. We knew Andre Hyatt needed to step up. We knew Mawat Mag had to step up. We knew Cam Spencer had to fill a role. Um, You know, there was hope Derek Simpson would play well. Uh, and all of those have come through to some, uh, in some way, uh, Mawat Mag's development was amazing. Andre Hyatt has, I think, developed, you know, he's not, um, you know, uh, he's been streaky, um, but I think he's offered a lot. He's definitely taken a step forward. I don't think that's really debatable compared to his contributions last season. Derek Simpson, you know, has, has developed. He's not fully developed. He's not fully ready, but I think it's time to, you know, let him, let him fly. And uh, he's got to learn on the fly. I think he can create for himself. He's to take the next step as a point guard. He's got to be able to understand how to create for others, you know, and that is something Rutgers is really missing Um, and something that Paul Mulcahy has done well so many times. And, you know, uh, I thought he saw, showed some flashes last night. Um, But this offense is sorely needing that. And uh, I think, you know, obviously the offense needs to be reassessed in the offseason. But I think let's talk about Michigan. You know, I mean, uh, I think it's, and I've said this, it's it's a bad matchup. Um, I I don't like the way Rutgers matches up against Michigan. Um, You know, I think we we, most of you would, would know that, you know, Rutgers has not had a lot of success against athletic, small, speedy guards uh, in the past. Kobe Bufkin, um, Doug McDaniel fit that bill exactly and gave Rutgers fits at the rack a couple of weeks ago. Doug McDaniel had 16 points. Kobe Bufkin had 14. Uh, they were combined 11 of 21 from the floor. Uh, they hit, uh, what was it, five? Uh, th- th- uh, they were three of nine from, from, from three. Um, they only had two turnovers combined. Uh, they combined for eight steals, Doug McDaniel and Kobe Bufkin. So they're a problem. And, you know, I don't know if Rutgers is going to have an answer for them. I do think they hit some very tough shots in that game that potentially, you know, could not go their way uh, in the rematch. Obviously, um, Hunter Dickinson, you know, is uh, as, as much as maybe people don't like him just for how he behaves. I mean, he is as talented uh, uh, offensively as, you know, a big man in the country. Um, he's, he's very, very good offensively. Um, and he got the best of cliff, uh, in that, in that first game. So that's a problem. Uh, you know, um, Jet Howard did not play in the first game. He should play on Thursday. He's a very athletic 
uh, guard. I'd probably put McConnell on him. Uh, he can be a little bit of a uh, ball stopper on offense and, and dribble it out, which could help. Uh, Rutgers, potentially, there's been arguments among Michigan fans and other college basketball people. Is Michigan, you know, almost better off without him just in terms of some of the issues that he um, amplifies? But this is a very tough matchup. I, I, I you know, it's uh, – I said, throw everything else out the window in terms of this, the mental state of Rutgers and, you know, how they look going into this. Um, you know, I didn't think it was a good matchup at the rack. Uh, Michigan, you know, is just, uh, they have length, uh, they're athletic and, um, you know, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be a tough one, but, and they're fighting, you know, they're fighting for their NCAA tournament lives as well. They're 17 and 14. They lost, I think three overtime games now or, or two, uh, in a row, um, you know, they've been in some dog fights. So mentally, you know, it'll be interesting to see what they, they offer. It's a noon game. Weird things can happen. Uh, but really the biggest question is where is Rutgers going to get offense to beat Michigan? Because they played really, you know, relatively well defensively. They held Michigan at 58 points, but they scored 45. You know, Michigan's been scoring a lot lately. So that was a very good defensive effort. They're going to have to be able to, to equal that defensive effort by really improving offensively. How does Rutgers improve offensively? Obviously, Spencer has to play a bigger role, I think, on Thursday. I, I don't know if you start him or not, but, I, you know, um, but he's got to play. He, he, he's He's got to play bigger minutes, and he's got to play minutes where Rutgers is in it. He can't be the guy that you bring in down seven. You know, he's got to be in there when Rutgers is, you know, in the game. Uh, not that being down seven is out of the game, but, you know, it's uh, starting to feel like when they are down that much, it's 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 such an uphill climb against a good team to get back into it. So Simpson obviously has to, to, to get the ball in his hands more. He can create. I thought he did a good job of looking to run last night. You know, Rutgers scored 18 transition points. Um, it's the only way they were getting easy baskets. They weren't scoring off of offensive rebounds. They only had eight second chance points. They weren't taking advantage fully off of turnovers. You know, um, they forced 17 turnovers on Northwestern, which is amazing uh, because they don't turn it over. And uh, they, they couldn't capitalize. Only 13 points off of turnovers, which is just not nearly enough. Uh, Rutgers just doesn't get easy baskets. They were 11 to 20 on layups. They were trying to lob it more to Cliff, which I, I think makes sense. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, I thought I, it kind of hit me over the head during that game, you know, and I've thought about it throughout the season, but Geo Baker and Ron Harper were so good at throwing the lob pass to Cliff in the paint near the rim, setting him up. You know, Cliff uh, was, I think, tied nationally last year for dunks. It was close to 80. And a lot of those were alley-oops, you know, and, and, and they were place-setting passes from, from both Geo and Ron. And I, Rutgers has not been nearly as good at doing that this year. Uh, they, they just haven't. And um, I think that that, that kind of hit me over the head last night. I was like, wow, you know, Cliff does not get – when he has to, to catch the ball in the post, you know, make a move, set up, um, you know, he's, he's, he's become a target. He's getting doubled, you know, and Rutgers has done a really poor job of passing out of double teams. And it's not just Cliff, you know. I mean, we saw it from multiple players – uh, last night and previous games. And when Cliff is mobile, when he's on the move, when he's able to maximize his athleticism, and that comes through the lob, he is unstoppable. And, you know, I'll maybe in the offseason, look at the percentage of baskets, you know, that came on lob passes last year versus this year, but it feels like a lot less. And uh, he got more on, on, on uh, Sunday night. And uh, it's going to be hard to do that against Hunter Dickinson um, and Michigan, but uh, I think that's that's something they need to to, to try more. Um, you know, it's it's Spencer uh, getting more shots. You know, he he had five shots last night. That's just not enough. And then you know, I had people coming at me today about you know, I, I people were concerned that his ability to create his own shot uh, earlier in the season, and someone said I called him a superstar. And you know, I would listen. I've been very high on Spencer, and. I, I still am high on him. I mean, he's the best shooter that Rutgers has had in years, probably since Quincy Doobie. And, you know, he – it's not the most – I, I think 
you know, people are used to seeing Rutgers' best players create their own shots, but it's not uncommon for good teams. I mean, Purdue for years creates shots for their best shooters off of screens. You know, uh, Purdue has done that for a long time. And Rutgers needs to do more of that for Spencer. And they've done it at times, uh, but there just didn't seem – it wasn't a priority last night. And, I, you know, Cam Spencer to get five shots, he's your best shooter. He's got to get 10-plus every game. He has to. And you have to make that a concerted effort to do that. And, yes, he's not a perfect player. And, no, he can't create his own shot typically off the dribble. He can get into the lane sometimes and, you know, get get around the corner a little bit. And he's very good at using his body. He's not fast or quick, but he can use his body uh, well. And he's very smart. So he can get into the lane off the dribble and, and score. But it's not something he can rely on. And he relies on spacing. He relies on his teammates, you know, and, and Rutgers has not had good spacing. They have not shared the basketball well enough, and he's suffering. And they need to need to set more screens for him, call more actions for him. They have to, have to, have to get him more involved. The ball movement, moving without the ball, I think is a big one, you know, and I think that's one in particular with Mawat Mag that he was really, really good at just moving without the ball, constantly mobile, constantly moving around. It allowed him to get um, – attack the offensive glass. He was never stagnant and Rutgers has become stagnant in the half court. And that's a huge problem. And I think it's been, been a big part of their struggles. So it's not just about sharing the basketball and moving it around, but it's about moving without the basketball. Um, they just have to, you know, and I think it does speak to their fatigue and, and their tiredness and being beat up physically and mentally too. And I think that, that you're seeing too much stagnation in the half court transition they just they they're, they're i think they're very good in transition they have to do more of it and i do think if you're looking for another spot i mean andre hyatt's offensive game has been lacking lately they really need to get him back on track but if not i think you have to try oscar palmquist i think he's you know he's small sample sizes but you know we're going back now i mean he's 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 hit, hit a shot in every game you know and it's not a huge impact but he's got to get um you know I think more opportunities and he, he didn't uh, particularly uh, do much last night, but he's getting a small sample size. And I think, you know, I'm not saying start the game that way, but uh, I think Pico, listen, it's postseason mode now. Pico said it, you know, he said that season's over. Now it's the postseason. You got to throw every, every tool out of the bag you can. You know, and, and it's, it is, I mean, listen, it, it's, it's a little bit of desperate. It's not a little bit, it's desperation mode. You got to try everything. And, um, you know, you don't want to reinvent the wheel. And I understand, you know, Pykele is very loyal and listen, there's nothing to make me happier to see Paul, uh, be Paul Mulcahy the way we know he can and has been before, you know, what he did against Michigan state in the garden was beautiful. I mean, that was just amazing. Unfortunately, he hasn't played close to that level since. And, um, you know, there's a lot of what ifs about this season, and we can get into that when the season's over. But, you know, focusing on Michigan, they're, they're – listen, this team can win that game. They're going to have to play really well. They're going to have to have a smart game plan offensively. They're going to have to play together. They're going to have to be more connected defensively. Uh, and they're going to have to gut it out. And, um, you know, do they have it in them? I believe they do. I know people want to say they don't, and it's over. You know, and I'm just, that's just not me. I'm not going to have that attitude with this team. Uh, they've done too much. They've been successful too much of the time. There's too many guys in this team that have succeeded. And I, I believe that they, they can do this. You know, I really do. Um, it's going to take a lot. You know, it would be really satisfying and, ooh, to beat Michigan. And that would put the nail in Michigan. You know, would a win clinch it for Rutgers? I don't know. But I just want to see this team play well again. And I believe they can. I don't know. Uh, this is a little bit of a ramble. Again, I, I kind of write down some topics and I just go. That's just my style. And um, I hope you like it. I hope this helped a little bit. Um, obviously, extremely disappointing to be in this position right now. Uh, and I, you know, obviously there'll be plenty of times for time for off-season analysis when the season ultimately is over. But it is not over. We are the program of Jim Valvano. Don't give up. Don't ever give up. I hope this team remembers that. And I hope they play a spirited contest on Thursday, win or lose, 
against Michigan. Their season's on the line. And I think there's enough, you know, there's veterans on this team. There's enough experience. I think we will. I'm not saying they're going to win, but I do think this team is going to go down swinging. And I think they can win, but they're going to have to play really, really well because it is a bad matchup. But like I said, Bufkin, McDaniel, they played really, really well at the rack. Going to have to make some adjustments on them. And we'll see what happens. Thank you for listening and watching and reading all of my coverage at the Scarlet Faithful. And I'll have plenty more this week. Thank you.